Hey everybody, this is John Sanders. Well, it's been over 10 years since I last messed around with PIC microcontrollers and I uh, got the urge to get back into it several months ago. And I got all my uh, picks out and got my software tools together and I started looking around the web to see if anything was going around, going on. Well, I was amazed at the amount of activity. There's uh, blogs, video blogs, there's uh, vendors that cater to uh, hobbyists. There's the whole maker movement. There's Adreno, just on and on. I just couldn't believe it. I thought everybody would be in banking or real estate by now. Anyway, especially on YouTube, there's all these projects of different people showing off what they do. And uh, a lot of them are pretty cool. But there's a bunch that don't have any information. They just show their little project off and, and don't say anything about it. And I notice there's lots of questions. Uh, you know, how can, how can I do this? Do you have the schematic? Do you have the code? And a lot of times those questions just go unanswered. So what I thought I'd do is maybe pick some of those projects out and uh, reverse engineer them. Well, maybe not reverse engineer them exactly since I don't have any hardware, but uh, at least look at them and see if I could duplicate them, figure out how they, how they do it and uh, try to duplicate the thing. So, um, well, one thing I work is uh, I work uh, with Linux a lot, so from time to time I'll be talking about uh, software tools for Linux, and uh, and I'm also on the cheap here. I've got uh, Pick Start for a programmer, and uh, driven by Pick P. Neither of those are supported anymore. I've got uh, GPU Tills for a, an assembler. Uh, I do have the latest uh, microchip MP Lab X, and might be. Uh, diving into that a little bit. So which project am I going to do first from YouTube? Well, none right now. Uh, I'm going to do a little project, uh, just kind of a make work project, uh, just to make sure I can uh, uh, build some hardware and remember how to program and stuff like that. So what I thought I'd do, since I'm pretty much uh, going to be interested in driving motors, is uh, I thought I'd uh, generate a little PWM output. And I was thinking, well, if you don't have a scope, you're not going to re really be able to see anything. Uh, so I figured I could uh, send that PWM output, have a changing PWM output, and send it to an RC integrator. And that way you could take a uh, simple digital voltmeter and uh, measure the voltage change across coming out of the integrator. And then I figured as long as I got that, I might as well send that into one of the ADC channels and get that to read the voltage value and uh, put it out on the display. So if you don't even have a meter, at least you can see something happening. So things that, that's going to be the first project I'm going to do. So uh, let's just jump into that and see how it goes. Okay, it's data sheet time. Uh, let's look at the uh, data sheet for our 16F87X family. There's uh, four parts in this family, and of course we'll be using the uh, 876. Uh, some of the main features they point out is high performance RISC CPU with only think 35 single word instructions to learn. Oh man, am I going to have to learn assembly language? Well, I'm going to do this in assembly language and in C, so uh, we'll cover both of them. Um, operating speed up to 20 megahertz. Instruction cycles uh, take a minimum of 200 nanoseconds. You'll notice 200 nanoseconds is four times a 50 nanosecond uh, period of a 20 megahertz clock. That's because instruction cycles take uh, four, in four external clock cycles to execute. Now, memory wise, we have up to 8K of program memory that's implemented in Flash up to 368 bytes of data memory which is implemented in RAM that's your general purpose registers and special function registers and there's up to 256 bytes of data memory that's implemented in double EEPROM uh, this part has uh, interrupt capability up to 14 sources uh, we'll be using one interrupt source uh, it has a 8 level deep hardware stack that allows eight uh, pending calls at a time. Uh, there's several system counters and uh, timers. Uh, power on reset, 
power up timer, oscillator start up timer, and a watchdog timer. And we're not really going to be concerned with these, but I mention them because most of these are configured uh, in the configuration word. And uh, we'll con con cover programming the configuration word when we get to the software discussion. Uh, we also have uh, in circuit serial programming capability on this part using two pins and five volts. Uh, whether you use that or not is uh, up to you and your environment. Proof of features include two 8 bit timers and a 16 bit timer. Uh, there's two capture compare PWM modules. Of course, we're going to be using one of the PWM modules and it requires the use of timer 2. Um, and the A to D converter, uh, we'll be using one channel of uh, that uh, for external uh, communications. There's SPI and I square C. We're not going to be using that on this project, but we will be using USART. One of the uh, displays is a, a serial USART, and uh, we'll be hooking that up. Uh, there's also brownout detection and a brownout reset capable. Here's a little diagram of our part, the uh, 876 right there. Um, it's 28 pin and we're interested in the P-dip. So here's your pin out for that. Uh, here's a little table of the key features and, uh, and uh, what each part is capable of. Um, we see in memory we've got full capability in all memory. On uh, I.O. ports, we only have A, B, and C. D and E are not implemented on this part. Uh, we've got five input channels on the A to D. <coughs> um, that's because uh, port A is the, uh, is the port that has the uh, analog inputs. And uh, one of those is not an uh, A to D input. Okay, here's the electrical characteristics. Um, temperature range 55 to 125 C. I think there's commercial, industrial, and uh, extended temperature ranges. Um, voltage on any pin with respect to ground is up to uh, VDD plus uh, 0.3. Uh, voltage on VDD with respect to VSS is 7.5 volts. Uh, they call out M clear here, up to 14 volts. That's because uh, M clear is the high voltage programming pin. They also call out RA4 separately, uh, up to 8.5 volts with respect to ground. That's because RA4 is an open drain output. So you can you need to hook up a uh, source of not more than 8.5 volts to get this pin to go high. Uh, current capability per pin is 20 milliamps in and out, sink and source. And uh, of course, eight times that for a whole port is, it gives you 200 milliamps. Uh, this is a set of uh, tables for voltage per operating frequency. You can see at the nominal 5 volts, you can run all the way up to 20 megahertz. If you drop down to 4 volts, you can only run at 16 megahertz. Likewise, if you decide to run in the 3.3 volt range, for example, you can only run at 10 megahertz. If you go down in the 2 volt range, you can only run at 4 megahertz. Now here's our DC characteristics. Uh, this is for commercial temperature grade. There's a couple of tables like this. Be sure you're looking at the uh, temperature grade table for your part. Um, basically we've covered covered the supply voltage. Interesting thing here is the data RAM retention voltage at 1.5 volts. You can drop down to that and still retain the memory in your general purpose registers and special function registers. Okay now here on the commercial still in the commercial section commercial temperature range here's our uh, voltage input high and low. Uh, we see that uh, we're a 0.15 volt uh, DDD for a input low voltage. 
that's a 0.75 volts uh, for the whole temperature range that's for the entire temperature range for what we're interested in uh, it gives a value of 0.8 volts now one thing to notice in this table here if it has VDD this is 1.5 times the VDD whatever you're running at from 2 volts up to 5 volts nominal uh, this means 0.8 volts period <laughs> like they should have left the V off here like they did like they did on this one because that's just 0.8 volts period and likewise for Schmidt trigger buffer it's 0.2 times VDD so that's one volt for voltage input uh, high uh, has a minimum requires a minimum of 2 volts and Schmidt trigger uh, requires 0.8 that's 1 volt for Schmidt trigger minimum now the Schmidt trigger inputs are the oscillator which so you don't really need to worry about that we're using a crystal and and port C I believe is the only other set of pins that are Schmidt trigger inputs now on port C we've only got one uh, we're only using one as an input and that's the uh, uh, well no I take that back we're not using we're not using any inputs on the uh, on port C so we don't have to worry about the submit trigger uh, parameter okay here's the product identification system now when you go to order a part you just don't you just need to think about more than just your regular part number you need to think about the the additional uh, parameters for ordering a part <clears throat> uh, the main thing is temp is frequency range and uh, they have speed grades of 4 megahertz 10 megahertz and 20 megahertz there's also uh, temperature grades and you want to really stick with commercial because price goes up as you go up in temperature and when you uh, are ordering be sure you include the package type you want uh, if you're expecting the breadboard in a, in a typical solderless breadboard, you want the uh, P-dip. I'll tell you one thing about, the, about frequency ranges. My parts are labeled 04s, but I'm running them at 16 megahertz. Now, <clears throat> the reason for this <laughs> is because when they start out with a part in, in process, and they don't have their process control exactly right. So... One of the main parameters, besides just a total failure of the part or something <clears throat> when the part doesn't work correctly, one of the main parameters is, is frequency uh, capability. And they'll have yields that, uh, parts that will run at 4 megahertz but won't run at 10. And they'll have parts that will run at 10 but they won't run at 20. And of course they'll have parts that run at 20 megahertz. <clears throat> so as time goes by, they uh, improve their process and they have fewer and fewer parts that only work at 4 megahertz and they have fewer and fewer parts that only work at 10 megahertz so what they do uh, they might get to the point where even no parts uh, fail below 10 megahertz but they still have that uh, niche to fill and people want to buy the, the cheaper 4 megahertz part so they'll take a part uh, that passes at 10 and just label it for 4 and sell it for the cheaper price. This way they get to sell more, more parts over time. So mine's uh, labeled 4 and it runs at 16 uh, pretty well. It should, could have been labeled a 10 megahertz part, but it wasn't. So but this is one thing to keep in mind if you do this. You can't count on this at all. It's just pot luck what you get. So if you're uh, doing this though, and uh, you know it's pretty fine for for working on breadboards, but uh, it's one thing you don't want to do if you start uh, making a product to ship to the field uh, and selling. Uh, you don't want to you don't want to try this, but you can get away with it while you're uh, while you're prototyping. But there is a danger in it because one of the main things that affects frequency is temperature. So if you've been playing around with your design and you've been testing like driving one LED and uh, just for test and you got that working right and everything's been 
going along pretty well, but your goal is to drive eight LEDs from one port, and you hook that up, and that starts running pretty good. As the part warms up, it's not impossible for the uh, part to start failing because of temperature, uh, frequency drift with temperature. So, and I guarantee it's the last thing you're going to think of is the oscillator internally failing because of a temperature rise. So you've got to keep this in mind if you get a part and you do what I'm doing, running a 4 megahertz part, it's 16 megahertz. So far I haven't had that problem. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, start building this thing then. Okay, and hooking up our uh, DO 1414 display. Uh, we need a a wide data port all to ourselves. Uh, we want to avoid the the PWM and the uh, analog to digital converter uh, that leaves port B with uh, no pins involved in those two functions <clears throat> so our data path only requires seven uh, seven data bits D0 through D6 so we're going to hook those up to our data lines and we use the extra one for write uh, it's kind of a loan and they uh, read write enable signal by itself so we'll take that off bit 7 of, uh, of port B uh, that leaves us we need two address bits and we'll put those at the high end of port C and uh, drive those everything uh, all these pins will all be outputs they'll remain outputs uh, the whole time we use them for this project Okay, now let's take a look at hooking up our DMC 2434 4x20 LCD. It's a parallel interface that requires seven data lines. So we'll take those off of port B. Uh, we'll also uh, require a read-write signal, an enable signal, and a uh, signal to uh, indicate uh, instruction or, or uh, data. So we're going to take uh, port B for our data, uh, port C, uh, upper two bits are going to provide uh, our read write and RS signals and the E will take off pin 13 uh, which is RC2. Alright let's take a look at the connections for our serial LCD display. Uh, this is real easy to do you just need to connect power ground and the transmit line from the PIC of course the PIC uh, transmits on uh, RC6 so we take that bit and wire it into our receive now there's no facility or pin on this part to send data back so there's no connection to the uh, receive line on our PIC just the transmit and this is great to hook up boy. one line over 12 or 13 lines is <laughs> is really nice um, this part is also capable of SPI and I square C and these are the pins for those and I'm not sure if uh, if by part by maybe this extension this D3Z indicates uh, serial configuration or whatnot but if you look in the data sheet you'll see that the uh, type of output used is selected by some resistor jumpers on the back of this display. Uh, this part, whether is well, this part comes defaulted with no resistors, and that selects the uh, the uh, serial USART connection. Now, whether D3Z indicates that or not, I'm not sure. I haven't really researched this part number completely. But uh, anyway, you'll see that uh, if you want to use SPI or I square C, you have to install some jumpers. To get those to work. The other issue with this is uh, I didn't hook up this VDD and this VSS. I did that basically just to see how it would work without them. Uh, it seems to work fine. Um, I don't know if uh, this would help or not. Distribute some power on the on the display itself. Uh, you can try it if you want. Anyway, that's it for the. Uh, serial display really easy to hook up okay let's take a look at the uh, data sheet for the DL1414 
Uh, you can see I've got a copy of, of one, obviously. Got a nice picture of it. Uh, mechanical uh, data is right here. Uh, looks like a maximum rating uh, supply voltage minus 0.5 to 7 volts DC. That's fine for our uh, 5 volt operation. You got the pin out here. Um, DC characteristics that we care about are uh, input current 100 microamps per pin. Uh, that's a uh, that's a uh, that's well within our capability on the pick. Voltage input high, and they want a uh, minimum of two volts. You'll remember from looking at the PIC data sheet, uh, our uh, minimum high was 4.3 volts. That's uh, no problem there. For voltage input low, they spec 0.8 volts max, and the PIC does 0.6 volts max. So we have no problem no problem there. Uh, right up here we have the timing diagram um, and down here's the data for it. Whoops. Looking at looking at all the times you know our instruction cycle is 250 mi mi uh, 250 milliseconds 250 microseconds excuse me uh, 250 nanoseconds gee I'll get it here in a minute uh, here the longest time we have to worry about is 110, which isn't even half of an instruction cycle. So there's really nothing we can do instruction-wise to, to beat any of these timing parameters. So we don't really need to worry about any of those. Uh, here's a picture of the character set. You can see it's all uppercase alphanumeric and bunch of punctuation. And uh, that's about all we need to know for the DL1414. All right, let's take a look at our driver code for a DL1414. First thing you want to do before you write any code is to uh, figure out what your configuration word need, needs to be. So let's look at the individual bits here. Uh, first we have CP1, CP0. Now these control the banks that you protect in your flash memory. Now we're not using any uh, code protection, so we're going to set these to 1. A debug, if you have a microchip uh, IDE with debug capability, you might want to be able to enable this, but uh, I'm going to disable this and uh, set it to 1. The next bit's always a 1. WRT is flash write enable. Uh, we're not going to, we're going to enable our flash, of course, so uh, for programming. So I'm going to set that to 1. CPD is data protection, and that's uh, your double EEPROM. Now all these uh, bits work together in uh, CPD, WRT, and the uh, CP bits. And the thing you want to do is look at the uh, data sheet for the 16F876 and check out table 4-1. And it shows you what's protected and how and when by all these combination of bits you can set. So when you use code protection, be sure uh, you refer to this table here. Uh, continuing on, low voltage programming bit. I uh, have this disabled since I'm using a pro, uh, regular high voltage programmer. Got brownout disable. Uh, using a lab power supply, you don't have to worry about many brownouts. So I've got that disabled also. Now we see CP1, CP0 again and they're an exact duplicate of the CP1, CP0 up here. And you have to set them exactly the same. And I don't know why they're duplicated in here, they just are. PWRTE, this extends the time, the uh, oscillator startup time and it also uh, turns on flash write protection at the same time. And I think it extends uh, your oscillator startup by 72 milliseconds. Uh, watchdog timer, I have it disabled because this requires code uh, to support this. And uh, I haven't written any code for watchdog timer. And the last two bits are the oscillator selection. Uh, using a 16 megahertz crystal 
I've used the, both the high speed and the crystal selection and I have uh, they both work fine I've settled on the XT setting okay all this gives us a value for the uh, configuration word of 3F39 okay now let's look at our uh, regular uh, registers we're going to use to drive our our display um, I know you've been admiring my ASCII art here uh, what I tend to do is uh, is build these in uh, in my uh, source file so I have the uh, data uh, readily available for reference uh, I've been doing this since before there was PDFs or dual screen monitors or any documentation aids like that so and I just keep on I just do it out of habit I guess uh, what I tend to do is uh, mark the uh, internal function of the part and then indicate what I'm actually using the port for uh, here in this case of course it's the port B is going to be the data bus to the DL1414 uh, here I've got the register banks that uh, this register appears in so I'm, I know how to set my uh, register uh, select bits uh, across the top I've got the actual pin number that these pins come out on and inside all the little boxes is the name as it's defined in the include file uh, for the uh, 16F876 okay so as I said uh, we're going to drive our data bus from, from port B uh, we only need 7 bits the uh, extra 8th bit going to uh, use for the write line and writes defined uh, right here is bit 7 now if you take uh, if you decide you don't want this ASCII art in here it does make the file pretty big uh, if you take it out be sure you leave these uh, equates in here because they're scattered throughout and uh, you need them to uh, compile the code uh, the tri-state control for port B this is always going to be an output so we set it to zero, set it and forget it. Now looking at uh, port C, we've got our address lines for the display. And we're going to put those in RC7, RC6. Also have a debug, defining debug uh, pin here and also defining PWM output. Um, even though we're not there yet, I'm going to set it now so we don't forget it. Um, I have those uh, bits defined here and for tri-state control we need to use value of 3C that makes 7 and 6 output and 1 and 0 in output okay let's look at our actual driver uh, it's pretty straightforward all you do is uh, set the address 3 addresses the leftmost character uh, we define 4 general purpose registers to hold our uh, characters uh, we get the first one into W called display drive display drive just takes what's in W puts it out on port B which drives our data lines and then we cycle the right strobe uh, to clock the data in and then it's just a repeat of that change the address to uh, address 2 get the appropriate character in the W called display drive and just continue on down through addresses 1 and 0 and that's all there is to it so uh, let's see how that looks on uh, on the actual display okay we've got our uh, DL1414 wired up and let's see if our uh, connections in our code work as we expect it should display the prompt and there it is, ADCV. All the letters are in the right place. Pretty exciting. <laughs> okay, let's go on and uh, and try the next display. Okay, let's take a look at our uh, Optrex 2434 data sheet. Uh, this is the um, this is the parallel liquid crystal display. I want to take a look at DC characteristics 
maximum 5.5 volts supply voltage that's going to fit right in with our 5 volt supply high level input voltage uh, is specified as 2.2 minimum on the pick we do a output high level voltage of 4.3 so we've got no problem there uh, input low level voltage is a maximum of 0.6 and the pick the picks output low level voltage is also 0.6 so that's probably going to be okay but if we ever have any problems low level we might want to see what we can do about that high level output voltage is specified a minimum of 2.4 and on the pick the uh, high level High level input is two volts, so uh, we've got margin there. Oh, excuse me, low level. Right, two volts, so we got no problem there. Uh, low level output voltage is a maximum of 0.4 on here, and on the pick, uh, input low level voltage is uh, 0.75, so we've got some margin there. Uh, timing uh, Of course our instruction cycle is 250 nanoseconds We're going to meet this 500 nanosecond enable cycle time enable cycle time is from one High going enable to the next high going enable uh, and we're going to have several It's going to be a couple instructions to set this set our data Go low. We're probably sticking to no op and then we'll be uh, figuring out what our next data should be before we start another high cycle. So 500, uh, 500 nanoseconds is not going to be a problem. Uh, the pulse width high, we'll probably have to, uh, that's only 230, we'll probably, we'll beat it, but uh, might just stick in a no-op. Everything else is a lot faster in our instruction cycle so I don't think we're gonna have any problems uh, there's optical characteristics you can take a look at those on your own the pin assignments right here our schematic is uh, connected up this way and I believe that'll do it for our uh, for optrix parallel parallel display all right, let's take a look at the uh, driver code for our, our uh, parallel display. Uh, once again, we're going to use port B for data out. Uh, we need all eight lines. Uh, this is mostly going to be uh, an output port. Uh, we do have to read it uh, for busy status from the display from time to time. So we define that bit here. Uh, so try state B. We're going to set it as default uh, as all outputs uh, when we need to read the busy port uh, we'll turn it around read the port and when we're done doing that we'll set it back to output you need uh, three additional lines for our display and that's the uh, clock line read write and register select I'm going to set the convention that those will always be low uh, except while we're, uh, we need to change them high uh, while we're using them back to low uh, to accomplish their function. Uh, those bits are all defined right here. And uh, tri-state control for that is going to be uh, a hex 3.8 that sets 7 and 6 low. Um, LCD E low. Uh, we're going to go ahead and set uh, the output for CCP2 low so we don't forget to do it later. And we got a debug pin here on RC0 we're going to set low. And as I said, that gives us a value of uh, 3.8 for setting up for configuration. Okay, the um, data sheet for our display uh, says that a delay of a little greater than 10 milliseconds should be enough to uh, allow the part to power up, reset, and configure itself for operation. Um, I've doubled this to uh, 
two calls to my 10 millisecond delay uh, to provide 20 milliseconds of delay and that's still not enough. The, uh, I find that it doesn't reliably start up at all. Now, I have located a uh, routine for manual initialization and I've got that included here and that seems to make it work. <clears throat> and it's just copied out of the documentation I found. You set uh, two line display a couple of times uh, each waiting a uh, time period. The third time you do it you can check LCD busy. Apparently that becomes active at this time. Um, then we set two line display again uh, setting an 8-bit interface. Uh, checking LCD busy. Then we set display off, cursor off, and blink off. Then we set clear and home to the display. And then we set the entry mode. And at this time it seems to be working. Um, I set the display on and the cursor off and we're ready to go. Uh, one note about setting two line display. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, two line display refers to a four row by twenty uh, display. One line uh, covers two rows. One line would be a, a two row by twenty and uh, and two lines is uh, four rows by twenty. So there's a little bit of confusion there. We'll, we'll see that when we look at the addressing. Okay here's the driver proper for our display. A uh, little sporting subroutine is this write LCD command where you uh, put the command you want to send to the display in the W register and call uh, write LCD command. Uh, it takes the W register, drives it out on our data lines on port B and cycles the clock and returns to the caller. That's all there is to that. Uh, to display characters on the LCD, uh, you enter with W holding the uh, LCD address. Uh, you set a uh, general purpose register called message length with the length of the message and another general purpose register uh, with the index into a table. And I'll cover that in just a second. Um, you call the uh, so you call this routine. It does the call to uh, write LCD command to set up the uh, character address. And then we set uh, the W register uh, to PCH. This is a constant value, and um, and we put that in a, in a system register called PC latch. Uh, next, we recover our index in W, and we call message table. Okay, now this takes a little bit of a explanation. Here's message table. And the first thing it does is it add WF to PCL. And this is actually the uh, least significant bytes of the program counter. Now uh, we have to take a trip here to our data sheet. This is the data sheet for the 16F876. Here's PCL. Uh, and here's PC latch. Now PC latch contains the upper five bits of the program counter. So we set it first, and then when you do an, an instruction that modifies the lower eight bits of uh, the instruction counter, that's PCL, it automatically loads at the same time the data that, that you've set in PC latch. This gets the page of the uh, data we're looking at, and this gets the actual uh, position in that page. This is called the computed go-to. So uh, the way our data table is set up is we have them all indicated. They all have their own label. Um, I've got four messages uh, at the top here that put out a one and a colon, two colon, three colon, and four colon. Now what you do is uh, first for the first message you set uh, W to zero. Now what's happened when this message starts processing uh, internally the PIC creates uh, moves goes ahead and moves the program counter to the next available address. 
So by the time this instruction executes, the actual program counter is pointing at the M1 address. So if you add, so if W is a zero, when we add, add W to the program counter, the actual address it goes to is here. If it was a one, it would go to this address. Now remember we called message table. That means we have an active call on the stack. The ret LW does our return and it puts, before it returns, it puts the character we identified out here as data into the W register and then it does the return. So that's how you recover the, the individual data bytes. Now, one advantage of this is you can actually do an 8-bit value. Uh, you can have, you can define something like, uh, instead of a character, an ASCII character, which is only 7 bits, you can, uh, for example, define a byte like C8 and get the full 8 bits this way. Whereas if you use a, uh, a uh, directive like DA and... Uh, and you were to, you know, and you were to define a little string, which is the uh, kind of the normal way, kind of the normal way to identify a string. What happens is, for the pick, it packs the the two ASCII bytes into one pick word, so you'd have H and E packed at one memory address. You'd have the two L's packed in the next memory address, and you'd have the O and the carriage return packed in the third memory address. Now, when you go to retrieve this data, you have to unpack. You have to unpack these into seven-bit uh, bytes. Uh, you don't have to do that with uh, return LW. Uh, one drawback is doing it this way with return LW. It takes twice as many uh, memory locations to store your data because you got the return command in there at the same time. So we'll look at that. We'll look at the normal way when we look at the uh, at the serial display. So basically, that's what's going on here. Now you have to know you have to know where these uh, addresses are. You have to know that by index from message table and you have to know how long they are. And we do that by just a series of equates here. Here we define PCH as being the uh, high byte of message table, where our table starts. So that identifies the page of our message. Uh, the first offset uh, for the first message we know is zero. Its length is uh, <coughs> You subtract its position from the, the following message to get the length. To get the offset, you subtract uh, its position from the, the previous position, or the, or the following position from its current position. Excuse me. Now I've got to, uh, I end this with OFF, which is totally unnecessary. If you look at this, uh, subtraction here you realize that this can never be greater than 255 but I put this in here to sort of remind me uh, that this is a low byte calculation uh, it's something that's really not required you can take it out if you'd like so anyway all the offsets and lengths are computed like that for the last length I need another there's no following message so I put in a dummy table in uh, to do the subtraction with to find the length for the last message also here I've got uh, a return uh, ampersand. Now this is really not ever used. This is here to catch if I accidentally index off of the end of the table. And it provides a real instruction uh, so I don't uh, go wild in the, into memory that's not programmed. Because uh, following the last byte of the program, if I was to index off the end of this table, it'd probably be uh, an equivalent instructions to no ops what would happen is the program kind of would cycle all the way to the end of memory roll back around to zero and essentially do a reset and it may cause you to wonder what the heck's going on the part resetting continuously so that's there just for a 
It's for a little safety net. Okay, so now we're right back to our uh, right LCD data routine. We know what this is doing now, setting up our page address, and we know what our index is for, and uh, how we computed that before we call this, and uh, call the message table, and we come back with the data in W. So then we drive port B and clock the clock line, and we keep doing that until we test message length, and uh, when we run out to the, we've used, gone through all our characters, uh, we return. And that's basically the driver for this. And uh, so let's go see how that looks on the actual display. Okay, got the part burned. Get it stuck in the board here. And I missed it. And we're back one. There we go. Okay, we're ready to test to see if this basic uh, um, light up the display works. Hit the power. And there we go. We got uh, one, two, three, and four. On lines on the first character position, lines one, two, three, and four, and we're pretty well centered on our logo and uh, ADCV colons pretty well centered. Or when we're measuring, we'll put, be putting out numbers or voltage reading uh, right after ADCV. So that looks pretty good. Uh, if you got a two-line display, this should work. Um, you should have uh, ADCB on your second line, and but you'll have a three. You'll have one and three instead of one and two, and that would be normal. So okay, it looks pretty good. Okay, now here's the data sheet for our New Haven serial dis display. It's uh, the NHD bunch of numbers here, and. Uh, Four lines by 20 characters, has an LED black backlight, some mechanicals, the pin description here for serial, this is great, uh, we got uh, power and ground and the uh, receive from the USART on the pick, so three wires to hook up, it's fantastic. <laughs> Look at our electrical characteristics. Uh, we've got 5 volt supply that falls in with our uh, plans real well. High level input voltage, a minimum of a uh, little less than a than a uh, half a volt, a little more than half a volt. Um, and of course, the output high level uh, from the pick is 7.5 bolts. Uh, it's going to be right in the neighborhood. Low level input voltage is a volt and the uh, output low level from our pick is a uh, 0.6. That's max. So point, no problem there. Got plenty of margin. Here's the optical characteristics you can read on your own. Uh, Got the RS-232 protocol, as I said. Uh, default baud rate is 9600. We'll just leave it there. Uh, and the RS-232 RS signal must be 5 volt TTL compatible. That means we can just use the output from the pick and go right into this pin. No need for uh, actual RS-232 levels at all. So that's another great thing about it. Uh, here's a table of commands, and we'll cover some of those uh, when we go over the code. And I believe that's about all we need to look at on here that goes over the commands in detail. You have uh, the capability of eight custom characters that you can program in. We're not going not gonna to be doing that. And here's the uh, character set. So you've got upper lower case numbers, punctuation, 
and all the goofy stuff. Okay, let's take a look at the driver code for our serial display. Now, uh, on the 16F876, the USART pins are on RC7 and 6. So uh, we're interested in the uh, transmit line, and of course we have to make that an output. We're also going to make our uh, PWM output. Uh, we're going to set it now just so we don't forget it. And we got a debug output on uh, RC0. So that gives us, uh, in the tri state control for register C, that gives a value of hex BC. That makes RC6, RC1, uh, and RC0 outputs. Now we have to set up our transmit status register. Uh, the power up defaults of zero uh, work for just about everything we want. The only thing we need to do is set BRGH, which is the baud rate select, to, to a one. That gives us high speed. That'll give us uh, the best resolution on uh, detecting our bits. So that gives us a value of uh, four hex to write to TXSTA. Uh, next is the receive status register. RC STA. Once again, the default power up of all zeros is great, except uh, we need to turn on the port by setting the serial port enable SPEN to 1, and that gives us a value of 80 hex to write to uh, RC STA. Okay, there's one other register to write uh, to set up our transmitter, and that's the SPBRG register. Now remember we set BRGH to 1 and we're running at 16 megahertz. So we check out this table here and for a 9600 baud rate we need to set SPBRG to a decimal value of uh, 103. Uh, that gives us an actual baud rate of uh, 9.615 and an error of 0.16% uh, which is uh, no error at all really. Okay, configuration uh, for our serial display is pretty straightforward. Uh, a delay works. You remember on the uh, parallel display the timeout delay didn't really do much for us. We had to go through a lot of gyrations but it works good for the serial display and uh, all we have to do here is clear the screen and uh, home the cursor. And that's done with uh, uh, calling this transmit command. And uh, let's go look at those. Okay, here's a couple of support uh, routines for our serial display. Uh, basically, they send commands to the display. Uh, there's one uh, routine that uh, sends a, a single byte command. And that's like uh, an example of that is. Uh, clearing screen. You just need the clear screen command. An example of uh, of a command with uh, data would be like uh, setting the uh, character address. That requires setting the character address command and then sending the actual address. So the way they work, uh, you enter with uh, your command in the W register. And that's immediately saved in uh, TX byte, a general purpose register. Now these have to, uh, to put it, the serial port in command mode, you have to send uh, this prefix word, and it, I think it's FE. And what it is, is uh, ASCII, of course, is, is seven bits. So bit seven is always uh, set to zero for ASCII. This is FE, so bit 8 is set to a 1, so it realizes that a command is coming in. So then we transmit that to the LCD. Uh, we pick up W from the transmit byte, which holds the uh, command we want to send, and it sends that uh, to the LCD. Uh, there's a delay to let the command execute. Transmit command D. Uh, which has the extra argument in general purpose register called CARG is the same thing for the first two transmits then it sends picks up uh, the argument from W and also sends it and there's a delay for that also. Now let's look how our uh, data is stored in memory. 
Now remember on the uh, serial port, I mean on the parallel port, we use the RET LW mechanism to get our data. Now this is going to use the DA directive and this lets you just define a string as terminated with a new line. Now the way this works is each, as each pair of ASCII characters are packed into a single uh, word. So a word, remember, is 14 bits and ASCII characters here are 7 bits. So the first ASCII character will go into the upper part of the word and the next ASCII character will go into the next part of the word. Then the next two ASCII characters go into the next address and same thing, the M will be in the upper bit and the space here will be in the lower bit. It just continues on like that. Now we need to be able to find where this is in memory. And we do that by decomposing message one, its address, into an upper byte by shifting it, by shifting message one in uh, eight bits to the right, and we get the lower bit by masking off message one into the lower bit. So here's our routine that displays strings like the DA command we just looked at. First we set the character address with our TX command we looked at a little while ago. And this requires reading flash memory, requires a lot of bank switching. So you see a whole lot of, of bank switching throughout here. Now the mechanism that controls reads and writes is double econ one register. First thing you have to do is point it uh, accesses to uh, program memory by setting the double e PGD bit. Uh, otherwise, uh, it would point to data memory. Now, to start an actual read cycle, we set the read bit in double econ one. And that requires a mandatory weighing of at least two instructions and uh, another bank switch and now our data is readable. And this is the way data is stored in the EE data H and EE data. Now this is an image of the way it comes out of our program memory we looked at. The uh, first ASCII byte is represented by these H's and you can see that it's uh, that its first upper six bits are in the six bits of E data H. And you can see its least significant bit is in the most significant bit of E data. So we have to get this shifted out of here. Now unfortunately EE data H is only a, implemented as six bits and it, the two missing bits will always read as zeros. So if we shift this this data up the bit at bit 13 is going to fall off into the bit bucket. So the first thing we have to do before we can use it is take E data H and copy it into a general purpose register so all the, all its bits are live. So now we can uh, take EE data, shift it left, that puts uh, this least significant bit of our ASCII word into the carry bit. And now we can shift the char which is holding E data H. We can shift it left and pick up that that bit. So now char holds the upper the first ASCII character. Now EE data is of course shifted uh, up wrong. We have to put it back. Now normally we might have to clear uh, the status bit to make sure a zero gets put back into this position. But uh, we know that since we always read zero zero from our upper bits here, that char, when we shifted him left, we know a zero came out in the carry. So we know carry's clear and we don't really have to do a, a clear C. So then we do our uh, rotate right on E data and that puts all the L's back in position and is guaranteed zero in the most significant bit. 
Now the rest of the routine just puts out our data. We first check for our carriage return. Uh, if it's not, we uh, just send the data to transmit LCD and then we do the second uh, register, the, low, the uh, second uh, character of the pair. Check it for a uh, carriage return. If it's not, we send it out. If we ever find a carriage return, we jump down to D-stop, uh, fix our register bank and return. And that's the driver basically. Uh, so let's go see how that works. Okay, it's time to check out our serial display. I'm going to tell you this is really nice to hook up. Power, ground, and one wire. That's alright. Let's see how she does. Well, I've got the PWM ADC voltage. And I didn't... <laughs> yeah, I forgot to put in the ADC V prompt. But, well, you'll see it on the when we do the measurement it'll be there this is pretty nice okay so our cereal's working that's great